Shalom, Shalom. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. I'm delighted to hear that you are drawn to the Jewish root that supports the grafted in branches. You know, Torah is central to properly understand and perform the will of Hashem, that is, God. It is crucial for us to understand theologically that the primary purpose in Hashem's giving of the Torah as a way of making someone forensically righteous only achieves its goal when the person by faith accepts that Yeshua, Jesus, is the promised Messiah spoken about therein. Welcome to Parashat Re'eh C. The address is Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verse 26, through chapter 16, verse 17. The reading date is for Shabbat, and I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel bin Lyman. The written commentary was updated on July the 3rd of 2006. Note that all quotations are taken from the complete Jewish Bible translation by David H. Stern, Jewish New Testament Publications Incorporated, unless otherwise noted. Let's begin with the opening blessing for the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol HaAmim, Venatan Lanu Et Torato. Baruch atah Adonai Noten HaTorah. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. You have selected us from among all the peoples and have given us your Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. This is Parashat Re'e, and uh, it's spelled R-E apostrophe E-H. Some of you have asked me how to pronounce these Torah portion names, so I usually provide some type of a of a little um, transliteration or some type of a a, f- a phonetic, uh, you know, spelling of it. Um, in this case, say R E H dash E H Re E. Now, the Hebrew word Re E means to see or to plainly behold. And in my experience with Hebrew words, and I'm not saying I'm an expert or anything, but in my experience with Hebrew words, this doesn't seem to be an emphatic use of the word behold, because if it were. I imagine that another Hebrew word, hine, might have been used instead. Now, the reason I bring that up uh, is because if you look down to footnote number one at the bottom of the page, if you're following along with the written commentary, and if you're not, just listen up. The Hebrew word hine, uh, H-I-N-E-H, is explained by Jewish authorities as, quote, untranslatable. And it's often rendered as hear or behold, um, but they go on to say that this is an approximation of an expression that has no equivalent in the Indo-European languages, those, this word hine. For this reason, the word hine is often left untranslated when we find it in the text. In general, it serves to intensify a statement and to provide emphasis. And um, in the uh, example that I lifted from, they indicate that it was a sudden or intense experience when it says hine. Um, the example that I pulled was from Genesis 15.4. The quote is taken from the Navigating the Bible online commentary. And in their uh, commentary to Genesis 15.4, the example is shown that um, the word of the Lord suddenly appeared to Abram or Abraham. And the word hine shows up in the text where it says, suddenly the word of the Lord showed up. So it intensifies uh, the experience. It shows that it was an intense um, uh, experience or happening. Uh, you know, just boom, there it was. So the word hine doesn't seem to be the best word um, for our Torah portion today. Instead, re'e, see, where Moshe simply says, see, Israel. Um, and, and of course, the verse says, see, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The word, in my opinion, the word re'e, it really has a very practical approach in mind, a very pragmatic approach. You know, the opening dialogue is practical. It's a heartfelt plea 
from the part of Moshe uh, to see or to plainly see, to behold that Hashem is setting before them, the people, a choice. And what are the choices? To obey and consequently enjoy the blessings or to disobey and reap the consequences of disobedience. It's quite simple if you think about it that way. It's very pragmatic. It's your choice. Choose one way or choose the other way. Now his opening word, re'e, is a call to understand the choice which is set before us as well. But first let's look at Israel's choices and then we can make some practical applications today, okay? Let's read the Pasuk, the opening verse of our Torah portion, Deuteronomy 11. Um, let's read the first two or three verses. Let's go down through verse 28, all right? Quote, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen to the mitzvot of Adonai your God that I am giving you today, and the curse if you don't listen to the mitzvot of Adonai your God, but turn aside from the way I am ordering you today, and follow other gods that you have not known. End quote. That's uh, chapter 11, verses 26 through 28. We can't help but wonder the mercy and grace that is being demonstrated for us here in this Pasuk. For we see that God tells Israel in advance that a blessing lays in store if they will listen to his voice and walk after his commandments. But the opposite is also quite true. If they fail to listen to God's words and keep his commandments, listen to God's voice, I should say, and keep his commandments, then the curse will ensue. The curse will be enacted in their life. And that's what it says. A blessing if you listen, and the curse if you don't listen. God is a God of choices, and God is a God of fairness, of justice. And his ways are righteous and true. And because everything that God does is righteous, then it is perfectly righteous for God to curse those who do not follow after his voice and walk into the obedience of his laws. That's exactly how God explains it in the Torah. And so as we read through the pages, and we, and I say we, I'm really speaking to the church, those are the primary um, uh, recipients of the podcasts that I produce. Again, I'm, I'm quite certain that not too many non-Messianic Jewish people are listening to my podcast, although I pray that this broadcast would reach the ears of those who um, have traceable lineage to Jacob and yet have not named the name of Yeshua for salvation. That is my desire. And if, uh, if for those of you listening to this podcast today, if you know well-meaning Jewish people who do not know Yeshua as Lord, then find a way to get this podcast into their hands or my commentaries. If you're, I mean, you're certainly free to distribute them. I don't put any um, uh, harsh copyright issues on my commentaries to the point that you can't freely distribute them. I've had people write in before and ask me, Ariel, can I can I send this to my pastor? Or can I send this to my to my family? Uh, and you're Christians. These are the people that write into me. Oh, of course, certainly you may send them to your friends, family members, pastors, and such. But even more to the point, if you know Jewish people, I'm not saying spam them. Don't do that. I don't condone spamming. Don't send people unwanted emails. But if you know of Jewish people, you have friends, and you'd like to put this in their hands, then by all means do so. Given the um, the tone of the uh, warning today in the opening pasuk, I want to pose it. I want to I want to uh, pose it a similar challenge. For those of you reading this teaching, and this, is, of course, is going to go out to the to many Christians right now. I want to speak not so much from a theological standpoint, but rather from a practical standpoint. Listen to the words that God is saying to us. This week, like Moshe, I want to take a practical look at the Word of God. The whole Word of God. From Genesis through Revelation. The Bible clearly offers a righteous standing with God. And it is the stance which draws all men towards the light. Wouldn't you agree? When we seek after God, and when I say we now, I mean everyone. Everyone has within them the desire to seek after God. Again, in the heart of every man there lies what I like to call a God-shaped hole. It's there because God put it there. It's an empty space. And guess what? Only the creator of all men can fill this void. And I think innately man knows this. That's why we seek to worship something, rightly so. This is the nature and design of the master designer. We have been created to worship. The problem is we don't always find the right thing to worship. 
in our blindness, in our frustration, we end up worshiping ultimately ourselves, and that's a shame. But the Bible gives us clear instructions so as to understand how to find our way back to where we came from. God created us, and therefore it is by God's design that we should find our way back to Him. And to this end, He has provided us His Word. So, how do we allow Him to fill this empty space? How do we allow Him to fill this gap? Well, this next section is entitled Torah, Its Roles and Its Functions. I talk a lot about Torah. That's why I've been named a Torah teacher. That's the kind of the function of my uh, job description within the community that I serve. I'm a Torah teacher. And so I talk a lot about Torah. I talk a lot about Yeshua too, but you must understand that the Torah is the greatest tool within the hands of the Holy Spirit because the Torah is God's self-disclosure. It is God's instruction for mankind. And it's for Israel first and foremost. But it was not to remain within the community of Israel. God instructed Israel to live in such a way as to attract the nations around them. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4. Also, consider the great commission that Yeshua gave to his Talmudim, to his disciples, was to go into all the world and share the gospel with everyone. So, in essence, the Torah is designed to be um, uh, exposed to everyone, everyone in the world. Now, the, firstly, the Torah teaches that we must recognize our need of repair. We are desperately broken as men. We are desperately uh, out of um, fellowship with God. We chose to walk away from the relationship. Remember, it's our fault. God did not push us away. God simply told us to... Um, <laughs> well, he, he told our parents, you realize. He told us to stay away from the tree. And instead, we disobeyed. We took up the forbidden fruit. And from, then, from there, it's been downhill. Fortunately... God does not leave us to our own demises. He doesn't he didn't leave us to figure it out on our own. The Torah comes along and tells us that we are in need of repair, that we need to fix the relationship that is broken. The biblical example gives us, well, actually, the examples are abundant throughout the Word of God, and they give us ample opportunity to find ourselves within what? The matrix of a God-centric universe, not a self-centered universe, like we, we so often uh, fool ourselves into thinking that the, the, the universe revolves around us. It doesn't. The universe revolves around the God who created it. And it's a universe where we are either for God or, by default, opposed to God. By default, we are born opposed to God. Now again, I'm speaking to the choir for many of you, but the reason I say the things that I say is because I don't know who will be listening to these podcasts. And it's my desire that... Anyone and everyone who is desiring a genuine relationship with God would listen to these teachings. We are, by default, separated from God. We're not born with a relationship with God. We're born into sin. And so we need God's help. Now, this recognition um, of sin in our lives... This, this recognition that I'm referring to, where we need to um, recognize our need of repair, our need of repair. Uh, before we come to know who God is and what our plans are about, or what, what God's plans are about, we, we need to understand that God has to give us the bad news before the good news comes. It's kind of like Paul's method in the book of Romans of explaining to his readers how to accept Yeshua. Before we can accept the good news that Yeshua saves, we need to appropriate the bad news that we are sinners. Therefore, the word of God, or the words of God, whether personally read, as in Paul's day, or heard at the mouth of those who are his, you know, we've got preachers today, we've got pastors, we've got messianic rabbis, we've got disciples, we've got, you know, everyone spreading the good news, which broke Hashem for that. Um... All of these things are designed to cause our heart to begin to yield to the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And to this end, all of God's words are designed to do this. There's no need to suppose that the Old Testament is useless in, in performing this function, whereas the New Testament is useful. That would be an improper viewpoint of the Word of God. We need to believe 
and and understand that all of God's word is designed to uh, carry this function. To be sure, the Torah teaches. Now, when I say the Torah, I mean the first five books of Moshe. The Torah teaches that all are sinners and no, and that no one can properly seek after God. The Torah actually teaches us this, and yet we read about it most clearly and most assuredly in the pages of the Apostolic Scriptures, uh, also known as the New Testament, also known as the Renewed Covenant, the Brit Hadashah. Uh, the uh, latter Ketuvim, however you want to distinguish these, this, this last um, third of the book that we yield. In Romans 3, uh, verses 9 through 20, we see it most plainly. Paul is telling us that everyone is a sinner and that no one seeks after God. Only the call of the Holy Spirit, only the Ruach HaKodesh can lead a man to finding God. We have all strayed from God and we need God's help in finding Him again. No man has found God of his own accord. Now allow me to illustrate this point by first explaining the role of the Torah in a sinner's life. Okay, I'm going to again use, as I often do, information from the fine folks over at FFOZ, First Fruits of Zion. They have a wonderful set of books on the functions of the Torah and the lives of the believers. You can still purchase Torah Rediscovered and take hold from FFOZ publications. Uh, again, as I am um, uh, becoming aware of information as it's uh, disseminated to me, I let it. I let you know. Ariel Berkowitz, the author of Torah Rediscovered and Take Hold, has recent, re- recently republished the um, Torah Rediscovered information uh, through his own publication or through a, a different publication. Um, Shorshim, S-H-O-R-E-S-H-I-M, publications. I believe it's Shorshim.org, but it might be Shorshim.com. So just... Type the word Shorshim and the word Torah Rediscovered in the same Google search and hit enter, and, uh, and I'm sure you can find the book. And anyway, these two particular books are some of the finest examples of explaining our relationship to the Word of God that I've ever researched. They're very pragmatic, they're very easy to understand, down to earth, that they're not excessively scholarly, is what I'm trying to say. And anyone reading the information is, can walk away with a an adequate understanding of the basic, um, uh, the basic uh, uh, details concerning how we are to relate to God's Word. And as such, I highly recommend both of the books. FFOZ um, publishes them. Quoting a few paragraphs, or I should say you can go to FFOZ's webpage to get that, ffoz.org, that org. And uh, so what I do is, um, let me pull some quotes from their books, alright? A few paragraphs are going to work for me. And um, I just want to share with you the practicality of the Word of God as it applies to both believers and non-believers. You see, God in His infinite wisdom creates a document, the Word of God, His, you know, the Bible. And this document speaks to both believers and unbelievers. It would be foolish for us as believers, once we've come to a knowledge of God through His Son Yeshua, to discard the very manual that led us to God in the first place. It would be foolish for us to jettison the, the, the instruction manual once we feel we've achieved the goal or achieve the purposes that God has set out for us. We have not arrived just because you're saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, or as we would say in um, charismatic circles, saved, saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Just because we are saved (laughs) doesn't mean that we have arrived. In, In fact, really, the journey has just begun. Once we accept Yeshua, it really has. We must continue to read the Word of God so that we can understand how to rightly live for God. It is our manual for right living. It is the blueprint for godly living. So let me quote a few paragraphs from FFOZ's publications here. Ariel and his wife, Devorah Berkowitz, write, quote, we're at the bottom of page two if you're following along with the written notes. Torah helps man recognize, excuse me there, microphone getting in the way. There we go. Let's try again. Torah helps man recognize his own sinfulness. That's from Romans 7, verses 7 through 12. This function of the Torah primarily concerns those who are not yet redeemed. Okay, Here we have the Torah speaking to the unregenerate man. Torah, they go on to continue, helps to bring about Hashem's wrath, according to Romans 4.15. Now the teaching here in Romans stresses that if anyone tries to use Torah to achieve justification, which is a buzzword for salvation... If anyone tries to use it to achieve justification before Hashem, then the attempt will backfire. The person will discover that he cannot obey it perfectly, thus achieving only condemnation. Very good information. Let me just pause and let that part sink in. 
that is very pertinent for today's religious people who seek to justify themselves in God's eyes by the things that they do. Justification by works. Justification by, um, by good deeds or justification by good attitudes. Going to church, reading your Bible, paying your taxes, etc., etc. Uh, these are good things that people do that they feel that God should reward them somehow. While God is impressed, I, I believe he is impressed with our good works. However, he is not going to automatically grant you salvation based on the things that you do. The reason I say God is impressed is because good works are meant to be done. The Torah is meant to be followed. And so if you're doing things that are in accord with Torah, or that are in line with the word of God, then Baruch Hashem, that's good, that's good, you should do those things. But what is motivating you to do those things? And is it done with a heart for love for God and a love for His Messiah? Or are you just deceiving yourself? Let me keep reading my commentary. Uh, the Berkowitzes go on to say, quote, The Torah acts as a protector. And they pull a reference to Galatians 3, verse 23, through chapter 4, verse 2. The question is asked, how? How does the Torah act as a protector? Well, they go on to say, quote, and this time they're going to speak again, oh, I'm sorry, they're still speaking to the unredeemed. Remember, the Torah speaks to both saved peoples as well as unsaved people. So let's, let's look at how the Torah is still speaking to unsaved peoples. For the unredeemed, they go on to offer this explanation. Quote, The Torah was intended to preserve the mental, moral, and social safety of the environment into which an individual was born and raised. The person was protected until the date set by the Father, which is, a, again, a reference to Galatians 4, verse 2. At which point in time the spirit of Hashem would lead them, this person, to the teacher, the Messiah. Now, the Torah protects them, and it does this by providing a safe environment in which they may live. The judgments, commandments, ordinances, and other teachings of the Torah all help to create a safe community surrounded by the protective border of God's Torah. So, Anyone who lives within the confines of the border, you know, uh, created by the Torah, anyone who lives within this community lives in relative safety. Now, this does not mean that the person living within the borders of the Torah is automatically safe spiritually or saved. Rather, living within the Torah community, his life is being preserved and protected as he awaits the time set by the Father, his moment of salvation. End quote. The information they're sharing with us there was provided in the book, I believe, by a little illustration. They had like a picture of the land of Israel, and it had these borders, and around the borders, kind of like the fence they're building around Israel now, it had these borders, and the borders were marked off by the words Torah. And basically, they're trying to describe how in the um, Torah communities of old, in the time period of the Tanakh as well as today, God designed the Torah to protect the community within the borders. In essence, there is a... There, there is a, a, a safety within the confines of living within the parameters of God's words. Those of you who've grown up in a, in, a, in a religious family, like a Christian family or a Jewish family, as opposed to those who grew up, say, in a secular family, a non-religious family, you can kind of relate to the example being shown here. The, 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 um, the ostensible advantage of growing up in a religious family is that there are this spiritual protection provided by your family, your parents, um, as you, a child, grow up within the, bo within the borders of hearing God's words, going to church, um, having family devotions, um, and, and having morals that are shaped by the Bible. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And I'm sure you'll agree. Um, that's what the Berkowitzes are trying to describe here. The Torah community uh, functions in that same way. Now let's go on to read. This, this this example that I'm giving with you helps us to understand the role of the Torah in the life of an unbeliever. What we want to do now is turn to the life of a believer. How does the Torah help us or continue to help us once we have already accepted Yeshua, the Messiah, spoken about in the Torah? Well, the Berkowitzes help us to understand, quote, for the redeemed, because the Torah tells us the truth, now the us is the believers, because the Torah tells us the truth, the difference between holy and unclean I'm sorry, holy and unholy, clean and unclean, life and death, it, the Torah, is both a protection for us and a written revelation of the grace of Hashem. Every man, woman, or child who chooses not to live within the teachings of Hashem, which produce life, is consigned to a place outside of the blessing and protection established 
by the teachings, and they reference specifically Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. They go on to say, We can also tie in the description of the Torah as the national covenant and constitution, in which the great king promises to protect his subjects through the covenant. Now, at this point in time, we the readers would ask, To protect them from what? And the Berkowitz's answer, From the kingdom outside of his kingdom, which is what? The kingdom of darkness. Now remember, they go on to say, The chief characteristic of the kingdom of darkness is death, with all of its legal rights. And if you need a reference, look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Also, I might add, um, as I interject here, remember when Yeshua was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil? The adversary offered Yeshua the kingdoms of his world if this Messiah, if Yeshua, would bow down to the adversary. Now, ask yourself this question. How could the adversary offer the kingdoms of this world if he did not possess them? That's right. The, the adversary has usurped the kingdoms of this world from our God. We know that God owns them, but the adversary is the prince of the power of the air. And the, he, he's described as Yeshua as the God of this world. I, I believe he's described by, by Shaul that way. Um, Yeshua uses similar language. The point is, is that the devil is in control at the moment, but he's not in absolute control. God still holds the... the, the um, uh, the legal papers to everything, the entire universe. God owns it all. That's That much is true. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But the adversary has been allowed to, to control the minds of men and to control the goings-ons of things to the point that um, there is a legal war out there these days between believers and, 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 and the adversary. And, and we're in a battle, and it's a battle of the spirit. We know this to be true. We know that the weapons of our warfare are spiritual. And, and we fight against spiritual uh, opponents. And so because of this, now, I can, now you can begin to understand what Ariel Devorah is trying to explain here about the Torah protecting us from this kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. They go on to conclude, quote, The legal aspects of the Torah declare the truth that the kingdom of darkness has no jurisdiction inside the boundaries of Hashem's kingdom, the Torah community. End quote. It's a wonderful picture being painted. If we would see the Torah as a protector, and again, it's not just the Torah by itself. It's not some amulet or some magical fetish that automatically protects us. It's not as if I just slap a mezuzah on the door of my apartment that suddenly the evil spirits are going to shriek and flee when they see the mezuzah on my door. That's not what's taking place, so don't misunderstand me. What we're talking about is that God's spirit has taken up residence within me, the believer, me, Ariel. I am the, the, the temple of the spirit of God himself. And as the repository of God's wisdom... God has promised to protect me. And therefore I need to avail myself of his protection. So it's not automatically granted per se. It's that I have agreed with God that he is my, he is my stronghold. He's my fortress. He's my banner of truth against deception. And as I continually foster a genuine, viable relationship with him, day by day I might add, only then can I expect to receive the protection that the Torah is describing. That's what the Berkowitzes are trying to get us to understand. As I walk in God's ways, God for his part does what? What did the Pasuk say at the beginning of our Torah portion? I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The choice is mine. A blessing if I choose to listen to the commandments of God. So you see, I avail myself of the protection of the Torah. And God for his part extends the protection. So let me continue reading my commentary. As we examine the words of Moshe in our current Torah portion, we can see that he is exhorting a group of redeemed people. They've already come out of Egypt. They are redeemed. He's asking them, he's commanding them to walk in the inheritance and the blessing that has been prepared for them since Hashem began to make a covenant with their forefathers. God in advance prepared this blessing for them. The blessings are the result of an obedient heart that desires to conform to the ways and the teachings of an all-loving Father. Hashem is indeed the loving Abba, right? He's the one who extends His love and mercy towards us. He desires to bless and prosper His children, which are, which is us. 
we the redeemed, as we read these, these, these blessings, they extend to us because we have availed ourselves of his words, of his ways, and of his spirit. But in order to experience the non-salvific blessings, which are, salvific simply refers to, uh, sal- uh, you know, salvific is related to the, related to the word salvation. Um, non-salvific blessings are those blessings with no immediate bearing on the salvation of an individual. In other words, everything that God extends to us is not related to salvation. Or I should say it doesn't produce salvation. Salvation is not the end result of every blessing that God extends. Okay? There are blessings that God extends to us that relate to this age, that, that are existential, I should say. They, they relate to today. Um, they're not all future by and by pie in the sky. Um, I'm not trying to um, um, make fun of that term, but y- you gather what I'm referring to. There are blessings that are designed to be experienced now, and these b- blessings that I'm referring to, in order for a person, a covenant member, to be able to experience these blessings, he needs to avail himself of God's instructions. So, please don't misunderstand me here. Genuine faith genuine faith, I mean the kind of faith that God recognizes, it must precede genuine obedience. James tries to explain this valuable lesson to us in the book of James, in the Renewed Covenant, in the Apostolic Scriptures. Genuine faith, if we have it, it's going to demonstrate itself on the outside. He gives the example where a man looks at another man, and the first man is a believer, and the second man, I don't know if he's a believer or not, but the first man is a believer, and he claims to have faith. And the second man is, is, has no food or no clothing, or he's naked or he's hungry. And um, the first man simply looks at them, wishes him shalom, and then continues going on his merry way. He continues walking, and as if he never saw the, first, the second man. And that's wrong. James explains that genuine faith will cause us to have compassion on our brother and to take action. Genuine faith will always lead to genuine action. Okay? Genuine faith is the kind that naturally leads into genuine obedience. And that's the point. If you want some references, I, I challenge you to go look up Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Look up John 14, verses 15 through 21, as well as chapter 15... Uh, verses 9 through 17. And then finally, go to the book of James, look up chapter 1, verse 21 through 25, as well as James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Okay? This is our heritage, and this is our responsibility. We have been given God's Torah. We have been given an opportunity to extend blessing to everyone around us. And God, for His part, will also bless us in return. But we have got to walk by the Spirit and We've got to walk by his words. So let's continue talking about this um, challenge. Um, but what I want to do right now is it's about 30 minutes into the commentary, and I'll go ahead and break it off and call this part A. So listen up, uh, continue listening, and when we return, we're going to talk about an ages-old argument within Christian circles. And the argument is aptly titled, Law versus grace. So in part two, we'll return to the top of page four in the written notes, and we'll talk about law versus grace. Stay tuned.